Uh, I don't think I've had the opportunity to welcome Elizabeth Harper back since she got back from her trip to Africa, but uh, she's over there having experienced three-hour worship services, right? And uh, been amazing. Elizabeth is getting ready to head out to Texas to school, and so we definitely want to keep Elizabeth. Elizabeth, stand up. So uh, we want to keep Elizabeth in our prayers as she heads out that way. But as she has done some fantastic mission work, and hopefully, prayerfully, we're going to get to uh, see some of those pictures and hear some of the stories too, uh, even as she leaves and as she shares those with us. If you have not read her blog, uh, you know her blog is ministry in and of itself. So Elizabeth, I've already asked her if I could use some in my sermons, and so you're going to be hearing more from Elizabeth even when she's in Texas. Thank you, gal. And uh, yes, amen. And then Lauren Franks just came back from Tanzania yesterday, got back safely, and lots of prayers went up uh, for her from you guys as well, and a lot of ministry done out there, and we are just fantastically glad to have her home. Uh, she craved Chick-fil-A biscuits, and uh, I'm sorry, Anthony and Marion, but t- we, we did go to out to eat on, and bought her a biscuit, so. <laughs> but we had the cash to do it. Where are they? They've, they've left. Okay. All right, but uh, we were glad to get her home. But both of these young ladies uh, are part of the message today, even though they don't realize it. And that is because they have planted seeds. They have been a part of some influencing that they're not going to know how much it has accomplished until they get to heaven. I mean, it's not going to happen until then. Yeah, they saw some little partial, you know, seeds planted and germinated and some smiles and some hugs and some some tears and some teaching and some lessons, but uh, there is so much more that's going to happen through them. Why? Well, it's all because God is working to influence the world through the likes of us whenever we serve Him. We're going to talk about that this morning. 1 Samuel chapter 13 and 14, but first let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father and awesome God, we we bow before you, giving thanks for members of our congregation, uh, these two young ladies, as well as so many others recently, and and those who are planning for the future, Lord, who are hearing you call them, uh, and they are answering the call. They are saying yes to you, Lord. Uh, Those who are taking a step of risk and of being an influence, whether it's half a world away, Lord, or in our own backyards, whether it's just getting our finances right so that we'll have the funds to support ministry. Lord, there are so many different ways you call us to be an influence today. And so as we look at the power of influence, Father, may we realize that that power comes from heaven itself. It's given by you. And it's given to those who trust a God who is influential on all of us. And so, Lord, again... You have words to teach us, you have messages to share, stories to to move us. But Lord, today, may we tune ourselves into what you would have us say. Whether it comes through an imperfect pastor, whether it comes through your perfect word, or whether it's silently placed on our hearts today, Lord, just between spirit and soul. Lord, then let it come and let us hear from you. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight. You are our rock and our redeemer, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. Amen. And I failed to mention, we're glad to have the choir back with us after their summer break, too. Uh, They're getting back at it, and if you'd like to be a part of it, uh, I know uh, Peggy would love to have you come in and and sit with us. And so, again, uh, a thank you to them and their ministry. I want to talk to you this morning about influence and uh there are a lot of people out there uh, when you talk about influence they're going to tell you that the people who are the most influential people in the world are those uh, those who are the movers and shakers are basically those who have their names in the headlines in one way or another all right uh and they're going to tell you there are people who are the most wealthy they have the most fame they have the most popularity uh, they have the most power or position in the world. Those are the, the influencers in today's society, uh, culture. And so I want to give you a little test to, to prove that that's not the case, all right? To prove that that's not true. In fact, what I'm about to do is I'm going to send out a list. Now, I want you to raise your hands if you can, if you can name 
if you can go through this list and name the ones on this list, didn't have anybody the first service who could do this the first time, all right? So we're going to see if it can happen in, in second service, okay? But again, these are people who have made the headlines and, and made the news at one point or another. First question, who in here can name the 10 wealthiest people in the world today? The 10, <laughs> Landon Merrill's hand goes up over here. <laughs> Oh, this ought to be good. This ought to be good. Where's Lucas and Tinsley? Uh, Lucas is heading for the kitchen. <laughs> All right. Anyone, anyone, other than, anyone other than Landon can name the 10 wealthiest people. <laughs> Chopped liver just took a seat over here. And so uh, 10 wealthiest people in the world today. All right, I, I, I even doubt Landon's power at this point. Uh, I don't think so. 10 wealthiest, no hands going up. Okay, again, made the headlines at some point. Name the, la- here's a good one for you, Landon. Name the last 10 Miss America contestant winners. <laughs> Anybody? Anybody can name, come on now. They were, they were on television. I mean, it was, they, they, but, you know, famous people supposedly, or, or at least this point. All right. Okay, guys, how about, uh, let's, let's get you. The last 10 Heisman Trophy winners. Anybody who can, I know you can name some of them, maybe, but all, all 10 of them. Ten, yeah. Okay, no, no name, no name. Okay, how about anybody here at the last eight people who won the Pulitzer or the Nobel Peace Prize? All right, no, nobody there on that. How about the last five Academy Award winners for Best Actor or Actress? Anyone? Y'all are lame, you know? I mean, like I said, these people made the headlines. They were, you know, you talked about them in the break room or people talked about them, you know? Uh, No, you're proving the point. You're proving the point very well because these are the folks that, uh, and we didn't even get into politicians, but these are the folks that people say are the movers and shakers. They are the influential. They influence not only people, but they influence culture as well. And I would say, not as much as they think so, all right? Because here's my next set of questions that help me to prove that there's a more important list. And these are real influencers and real movers and shakers, if you would. Think of 10 people who have taught you something worthwhile. How many of you can name 10 people who have taught you something worthwhile over your lifetime? All right, so more ands there. Name 10 people you enjoy being around. How many can name 10 people? Not necessarily the people you're sitting beside right now, but uh, all right, and hopefully that's the case, all right? Name five people who have helped you through a difficult time. Five people, you can do that too, right? All right, uh, let's go. List a few teachers, just a, a handful of teachers who really, you really enjoyed learning from while you were in school. You really got something from them. Okay, we can do that. Name a few heroes whose stories have touched you and inspired you. How many can name few heroes? All right, good. Name your three favorite preachers. <laughs> Thought I'd try. <laughs> I love it. I, so, not several Sundays ago, same thing happens. Uh, and it happens quite often in this place. But somebody goes out of the service and they're shaking hands with me. Heard a great sermon today, preacher. And I'm thinking, yes, indeed. He said, I listened to Charles Stanley before I came today. Yeah. <laughs> Good, I'm glad, you know, I listen, I listen to them occasionally myself. But you see, that list, that second list got a lot easier, didn't it? Because those are actually the people who really, truly touched you. They influenced you in one way or another. Now, let me give you a harder test. Let me ask you this. When was the last time your name appeared on somebody else's list as being one of the most influential people in their lives? When was the last time? Let me get even more pointed, if you would. When was the last time you walked with God so closely, your walk with God was so close, was so real, that someone actually looked at you, whether, and and maybe you'd have to know it to answer the question, I guess, but that they decided because of your walk to change the direction they were going in and follow the same God you're following. Now, Mom, Dad, I hope you can look down that row and see your kids or your grandkids 
or uh, Sunday school teachers, I hope you can look throughout the crowd and see some folks who did just that as well. I hope you can see somebody in our lives. But I want you to think about that question as we get into the scripture and the story for today. When was the last time your walk with God was so close that someone looked at you and said, I want what they have. I want what they have. And they followed, they changed courses and they follow the God you follow now. Truth is, we might not know that answer. It's like Elizabeth and Lauren. We might not know the answer as to the seeds planted and the people influenced until we get to heaven. I mean, that's just the way it is, all right? Prayerfully, we can know some of the harvest that's been gathered, and we can see that. But we might not know it. But the disciples were called by Jesus to live their lives in such a way that it influenced the world, all right? That's one of the reasons we're looking at this story of this one moment in a guy by the name of Jonathan's life. We're not looking at his complete life, but several of you have gone out and said, you know, he's one of your favorite characters in the Bible, and for many reasons. But this is just one story, one little snippet with regards to here was an instance in his life where he truly was an influence, not only to those around him in the moment, but also to the nation of Israel, and to the world coming later. So, 1 Samuel chapter 13 and 14. How many of you love those documentaries today? And you watch them, and they'll have a, a news break, I mean a commercial break, and they come back on with a commercial break, and they pretty much review the whole thing all over again, and then you have about five more minutes of, of new stuff. Well, that's what I'm going to do today, okay? Here's, here's, the, the, here's where we've been, all right, so far. Remember, we are at the point of a battle, at least that's God's plan, okay? God's plan is that there's getting ready to be a battle. We have the Israelites on this hill over here. We have the valley here. And on this side, we have the 10,000 or so Philistines. And needless to say, many have deserted from the ranks of the Israelites. There are only about 600 who are shaking and quivering over here. Uh, King Saul, who leads them, of course, and Jonathan, his son, who's one of the soldier officers as well. And uh, they, they have an armor bearer. Jonathan has an armor bearer with him. And we have seen King Saul sit on his, on his seat and do nothing, absolutely nothing. It, well, well, he did make one big mistake, remember? Before the prophet Samuel got there, he decided to take matters in his own hand and start the process of worship. And God said, I don't want you doing that. And he paid the price. And, and so Samuel comes on the scene, the prophet, and says, okay, King Saul, because you did that, your dynasty is taken away from you. There is another guy who's going to be leader of Israel, and it ain't going to be you, all right? So King Saul now hesitates. He just sits there shaking like the rest of his army. And Jonathan, his son, watches. Jonathan, his son, watches his dad do absolutely nothing while this army over here gets stronger and stronger, and this one gets weaker and weaker. Jonathan says to himself, something's got to be done, and I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And so where we end up is in chapter 14, verse 6, we looked at already, and Jonathan says to his young armor bearer, that's the little teenage kid who's holding his shield, carrying his armor with him, and he says, come, let's go over to the outpost of those uncircumcised fellows, the Philistines over here. Perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. And then last week we looked at the first part of, of this, uh, this next verse, verse 7. It says, do all that you have in mind, the armor bearer said to Jonathan. And we looked at a little bit of it. I said I wanted to talk more about that today though. And his armor, armor bearer said then, go ahead Jonathan, I am with you heart and soul. All right, class, that's as far as we're getting today in the story. All right, and there's a reason for it. We're talking about the power of influence and I want you to see that power right now. Notice three things that Jonathan did not do. When Jonathan got ready to make a move, he, he sees that God moment. And he said, yes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to listen to you, God. He didn't do three things. One thing, he didn't tell his dad. He didn't tell the king of all Israel what he's about to do. Why not? We pretty much discussed that, and you can pretty much read it in Scripture. It's because, number one, King Saul was doing nothing. He was shaking in fear. But number two, he was pretty apathetic. He was pretty, Jonathan knew his dad wasn't going to do anything. So, number one, he doesn't tell his dad. Number two, he didn't worry about not having enough help. Now, here, here's the difference in Jonathan and a David, this David. If it had been me that God said, I want you to go across the valley and I want you to fight the Philistines, I would have gone from soldier to soldier. 
And I would have lobbied, all right? I would have lobbied, don't you want to go with me? What can I pay you to go with me? We'll stop at Bojangles and have a biscuit or something like that, okay? But, but please go with me. Jonathan didn't do that. He basically says to his armor bearer, you, it's you and me, buddy. It's you and me. And I'm sure Jonathan would have gone even if his armor bearer had said no. So he didn't do that either. And the third thing J- uh, Jonathan didn't do, he didn't allow his limitations to limit him. He basically has one, piece, uh, one weapon, one, one, one piece of armament, if you would, all right? It's a sword. And the rest of the army, basic, they didn't have that. And he has a shield. And he has one armor bearer. But he's got something that King Saul didn't have. Old dad didn't have the trust in the Lord. He didn't have the trust in the Lord of the impossible, the God who can say, I want you to do something and then give you everything it takes to get it done, right? And so Jonathan has that. He knows that none of the others has. And what's so amazing is that this is all it took for Jonathan not only to inspire this young this young armor bearer, if you would, but it influenced him more. Now, you're, you may be... Before we added that piece of scripture today, that last piece, you could look at verse 7, and the armor bearer says to Jonathan, when Jonathan says, I want you to come and go with me, the armor bearer says, do all you have in mind. And you might look at it as, okay, Jonathan's in authority. Of course the armor bearer is going to say that. Of course this young teenager is going to say, I will go with you. All right? But today we add a little bit more that shows you the influence goes a lot deeper. Okay, because what he says in this second part, he says, Jonathan, do everything you have in mind. I am with you heart and soul. And I want you to think about those words for a second, because that separates the believer sitting in a church pew or standing at a pulpit who has a casual acquaintance with Jesus Christ from those who have a close personal walk with Jesus Christ, a true relationship. It's that many times those with a casual acquaintance will sit or stand and say, God, do, it, do all you have in mind. Do all you have in mind. But it's those who are walking closely with him who go a little bit further and say, I am with you, Lord, heart and soul. Heart and soul. I want you to see this. This is the power of influence right here. You may have the authority or the position or the money to order someone or pay someone to follow you into a risky calling or to do anything really but that doesn't mean you have their loyalty that doesn't mean you have their friendship that doesn't mean you have their heart when you need it the most some of you are employers you know the difference between an employee who is there for the paycheck and an employee who truly has your heart and soul or you have their heart and soul you know the difference they they give a little bit more to the work don't they they, they're a little more loyal to the, to the company. They're, 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 their product is a lot more satisfying and the way they produce their product probably. Well, this is exactly what it's talking about here. Is Jonathan had the power and authority to order this guy to follow him. But this guy basically says, Jonathan, I'm going to follow you, not because you have the authority, but because you've influenced my life. And believe me, influence is born out of trust you got to trust somebody to follow somebody into a life or death situation like this. What influence does that authority doesn't do, I wrote this down, what influence does that authority doesn't do is it reaches to the heart and soul of a person. That's what influence, that's why those people that I listed or had you list a while ago as those in your life made your list. Not just because they held some sort of authority figure in your life, some of them did, whether they were teachers or parents or grandparents or something like that. But you loved them with your heart and soul. You trusted them. And that's why you gave your life and them, they gave their lives to you. You see, influence is born out of that kind of trust. And like Jonathan, when we know something is right, when we know something is a God thing, when we sense God's will in it, we can't be afraid to call those who would listen to follow us. You want to know why I am so proud of these two young ladies? Uh, who left home and, and, and families to go do what they did, is these two young ladies heard a mission call that was outside of our church. It, it's wonderful, but they were basically at events, different events, where they heard another group who were going on a mission trip, and they didn't necessarily know the people they were going with or knew them very lightly or, or loosely, but they said, you know, I hear God's call, and I'm going to go. Whoever's going, I don't care if I don't know them, I'm going to go. 
Well, this is exactly what's happening here. I, I get excited about this sort of thing because what you see here is this is what Jonathan does. He steps out, but his influence is sort of like throwing a rock into the water and the, the waves just continue to, to move out and move out and, and go further and further. Jonathan's influence goes further and further, and the guy who's the armor bearer goes with him. He believed in Jonathan enough to say, whatever you want to do, I'm with you. Here it is, church. The fact is, you and I will never fully know how many people you have influenced in your life already. I hope you are on somebody's list in that sort of way, a positive list, okay? I hope you are. I hope when you get to heaven, somebody comes up to you and says, you want to know why I'm here? It's because you had something I didn't have and I saw it in you. Or because you shared it with me. You actually shared it with me. And that's why I'm here. You know, what we do need to know here on earth is that when we step out in faith and we seize a divine moment, when we choose to make a difference in the world for God, others take notice and it can change their lives. And that's what I want you to take out these doors today. Others take notice that you're in this place. Maybe neighbors that didn't, you know, they don't go to church, but they looked out the window today and, and they knew they knew you were heading out. You know, I kidded Anthony and, and Marion a while ago. They, they knew Anthony and Marion weren't going to Bojangles for a biscuit. They knew they were coming to church. Same thing with you guys. But they're watching you because what your neighbors who do not believe in God or what your coworkers who know you, what you did on Sunday morning, that what they're going to want to know is, are you different today than you were on Friday? Or has the influence of where you are today and who you've been with and who you followed really changed you at all? Has it made you who you are? They're watching you. They're watching you. How many of you have ever been in a restaurant and you bowed your head in prayer and maybe at some point during the, the meal or afterwards uh, somebody came up to you and said, hey, you know, I, I, I saw what you did and I just appreciate that. Some of you are shaking your heads. You know exactly what I'm talking about. People are watching you to see if your walk is real or not. When I was growing up, we had this small church and we were probably about 50, 60 people there on a Sunday morning, even on a good Sunday. And we were right next to a college town, or right next to, to a college that raised up uh, kids that went into ministry, a lot of religion students that went into ministry. And so through the years that I was growing up, we had a lot of what I would say were preacher wannabes. Uh, and they would come and they would stay for a few months and then they'd leave. Or they'd come and stay a year or two and then leave. And they were going to greener pastors or, or, or getting out of ministry or whatever they were doing. And I sat back in a pew. I didn't know where I was going. I didn't know where God was going to take me. I didn't know what I was going to do. But one thing I did know, I watched to see if these people were real or not. I watched them. I watched them as a kid, even when I was counting light bulbs and things doing that people thought I wasn't paying attention at all. I was watching, you know, and, and, and the thing was, I was watching to see if these preachers are real. Are these Sunday school teachers real? Are these church leaders, these deacons in our church real? Are, are is what they present on a Sunday morning in these walls different than what, how they live outside this place? People are watching you, my friends. They're watching you. And they are either turned on to Jesus because of you or they're turned off. They're either saying, it's sort of like an old story I used to, to use all the time about a dad whose son finds he's going to have a, he has a terminal illness. He's going to die. And the doctors ask the dad to take care of telling him. And, and the dad goes into his room, sits on the bed with him hugs each other, their tears, and he tells him, son, you don't have long to live. And he just, as best he can, he shares it with this little boy. And after a few moments, this dad looked at his son and said, son, are you afraid to meet Jesus? And the little boy looks up at his dad and says, not if he's anything like you, dad. Yeah. That would be the most fantastic thing for some preacher someday to be able to say about you or me is that I don't mind going to heaven if Jesus is a lot like this person, you know? But that's exactly what he's saying here. People are watching you, and they're either turned on or turned off. And they're turned on to turn off because of the influence you are out in this world. So the question is, very simply, what kind of influence are you? Not on a Sunday morning when you look so good. 
What kind of, what kind of influence are you in the office, in the schoolroom, in the backyard, at the restaurant, in the store you're shopping at? With the clerk who's a little bit frazzled, and so that's running you frazzled. With the, with the drive into work, and you are just getting madder and madder because it's just getting harder and harder to get there. You know, what is it for you? What's yours like? You know, I asked you a few minutes ago, when was the last time you influenced someone so that they actually changed directions and followed Christ because of you? You want to know why that is so hard for us to answer, including preachers? Here's the reason. First, it's because you and I don't know who's watching us or when. And secondly, it's because most of us are not really intentional about going out of the house and looking like Jesus in the first place. Let me challenge you on something today to make this part of your getting up in the morning and starting to breathe, okay? Okay? The challenge is this. Get up tomorrow morning, sit on the side of the bed, and just say to the Lord, Lord, I want to walk so closely with you that when somebody else looks at me, they see you. That's what the choir just sang a while ago. You know, when anyone looks at me, let them see you. All right? As best as they can, let them see who you are. That's maybe why Paul said, he said, you know, I can live and be like a Christian, a believer, a, a Christ follower doing this. But if I see a weaker brother or sister who is just growing in the faith and they're not quite there yet, then I am, even with the freedom I have to do something, I will refrain from doing it if I think they will stumble because of it. You remember when he's saying this? And he's talking about food that's worshipped and he, uh, that's used as idol worship. And he's basically saying, okay, to these Corinthians, he's saying, you're going to, out to eat with these uh, Corinthians or you're going to their home. And they have, they have bought meat that has been sacrificed at, a, at, a, at, a, at a, a temple of a false god. And he says, I can handle that. I can handle eating that because you know what? I know it's, it's, it's just meat. It, it's, it hasn't been served to a false god. There is no other god. He says, but if there's someone who's coming along behind me who's younger in the faith and they say, oh, Paul's eating something he shouldn't be eating, then Paul says to himself, I will refrain from eating. In fact, he said this in, in 1 Corinthians 8 9. He says, be careful that the exercise of your freedom does not become a stumbling block to the weak. In 1 Corinthians 10, he says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Don't cause anyone to stumble. Okay, what does that mean for you and me today in 2017? Here's what it means. It means if there's some movie on at the theaters that everybody at work is saying, you got to see this thing. You, it is so wonderful. It is, it is just great. But you've looked at the reviews and you've seen the profanity, you've seen the nudity, you've seen the things that, okay, aren't really, you shouldn't be looking at, then what it means is, is you actually refrain from going to see something like that. Or if it shows up on TV, or if it shows on your computer, it means you refrain. It's being the contagious Christian that God wants you to be means going, doesn't, you don't go to some of the places the rest of the world goes, it means you refrain from going those places. If being the witness Jesus wants us to be means that you curb your language and you guard your thoughts and you control where your eyes wander, then you do some curbing and you do some guarding and you do some controlling. In other words, we're to live on this plane. And God says most of us are just content living right here. He says your influence, though, it's moving people. They're watching you. They know you. They know you. I'll tell you this one. This, is just, this one just came to mind, all right? And I can get you in still under the hour, okay? No, I can't. But anyway, I'll never forget having a guy come up to me, and he had seen one of the guys, one of the members of this church who coaches, who has coached in the past and coaches some now. And he came up to me and said, does so-and-so go to your church? And I said, yeah, they do. They name. And they said, well, undoubtedly you weren't there to hear the language they were using with their players and with the people sitting on the bench the other day at that game. And I thought to myself, okay, you know, we're not perfect. None of us. Sometimes we let some things slip. Sometimes we go places we should. Sometimes we do some things, think some things. We're not perfect. But I'm thinking to myself, here's what that person is thinking not only about that person they saw, but about this church. 
and what we stand for. You see, your influence goes beyond, great. it's greater than what you think, my friends. Greater than what you think. And next week, when we come back to this story, you're going to see how far it went with Jonathan's. But again, God's watching you too. And maybe he's hearing you stand up and praise him and, and pray to him in this place and then go out and you're using, you're getting with your group and you're telling those stories that you shouldn't be telling, you know. Or you're getting with this group and you're sharing some gossip and you're running this person down and you shouldn't be doing that. So again, what's your witness like? What's your witness like? Maybe he's watching you give a leftover in the offering plate or give a little bit of time every now and then to a service, but He's seeing you waste a lot of good time and a lot of good money doing a lot of things that are ungodly. Maybe he sees those brief moments of concern when you stand in here and you sing those songs or you hear a, a testimony or something and your heart is moved and the tears come to your eyes and you feel God really pushing you to get involved in something or do something and you walk out the door and life caves in and you forget all about that. You see, God didn't use that moment when Jonathan said, come, let's go, just to move in Jonathan's life. He wanted to influence the entire nation of Israel, and he does it. Because here's the deal. Here's a little preview of what's coming next week. Those guys who are hiding in the caves, those guys who deserted and they're hiding in the hills, are still looking down on the Israelites. And they're seeing two guys scramble across the valley. They're watching, and it's going to make a difference. It's going to make a difference. What's God given you? To make an influence in your in the life of this world right now who does he want you to rub off on you see our lord can't wait to give you more open doors of opportunity but he's waiting for you to use the doors you've already have opened before you and some of you are just standing there some of you're waiting and when jesus says come let's go he wants to hear you say all right lord do all you have in mind i am with you heart and so, and when you do that, throwing the little pebble into the, the water, the waves just continue, and you influence more and more and more. I want to close with a story that goes along with this so well. Back in the 1850s, and I know that's a long time ago, but you stick with me because I'm going to bring it up here in just a second. Back into the 18, in the 1850s, there was a guy who lived in Chicago. He was a shoe salesman. All right, actually owned a shoe store. And uh, he hired a, little, a, a kid to come in and work with him. And this kid came in and started work for a couple of weeks. And uh, the guy saw that this kid was um, a long way from God, a long way from anything spiritual. And so one day, this guy by the name of Kimball, he puts his, his hand on this little boy's, this teenager's uh, shoulder. And he says, son, I have a concern for you and your life and your spiritual life. And in that moment, he shared the gospel. He influenced in that way. And he led this young man by the name of Dwight L. Moody to Christ. Dwight L. Moody grew up, and in uh, years later, many of you already know the story, he became a fantastic and a great evangelist. But he was sort of like those chicken farmer preachers around here. He didn't always use the right language, and things didn't always make sense how he put it together. He was uneducated, and for the high society, <clears throat> you know, hoi polloi, he was just a little bit uh, unnerving. But he got the message across, and God used him in such a huge way in America that he was invited by a great English pastor by the name of F.B. Mayer to come to England and to preach in his huge church down London town, all right? And so Moody goes to preach in this pulpit full of high society, high class individuals, okay, influential people. And he gets up behind the pulpit, and he really didn't stay behind the pulpit very long because Moody has a way of getting out in the aisles in the audience. And he began to preach, and he used words like ain't, and you know, and he didn't tie things together in very well. And he, 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 they said he was uneducated, and he just unintelligible, some of them said at points. F.B. Mayer was sitting back here in the preacher's seat as this guy was preaching. And he had no sooner started preaching when Mayer thought to himself, why did I ever invite this guy to come from America and preach in my church? Immediately after the service was over, the next day I should say, he started going around to the members of his congregation who he thought had been offended by Dwight L. Moody's preaching. <laughs> and he goes into this one house, very high-class 
part of the town, and he sits down with this lady who, who, who teaches her Sunday school, a huge Sunday school class. He's getting ready to do damage control is what he's doing, all right, to, to apologize for having this preacher, I'll never, ha- never happen again, so blah, blah, blah. He gets ready to open his mouth to do that, and this lady is sitting there, and she says, oh, Dr. Mayer, I have been so convicted since Pastor Moody was here. I have not only come to Christ, but I have also visited every one of my Sunday school girls, and I have led each and every one of them to Christ. Well, think of a preacher being told that all these women who were in Sunday school, they were never at Christ, and all of a sudden they've come to Christ. It convicted Mayer. Mayer went home. Story goes, he got down on his knees, and he said, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me for my ego. Forgive me for my attitude. Make me like Moody. And the Lord did. And Mayer started preaching evangelically. And guess what? People in America heard about this English preacher. They invited him to come to America. He comes to America, and where he found his, where he found his greatest joy was going to college campuses. And so he would go around to college campuses, and he would preach for uh, the, the different college campuses, leading, of course, many to Christ. And as he's preaching one time, a college student by the name of William Chapman comes forward. He receives Christ because of Pastor Mayer, Dr. Mayer, and he goes home. He begins to work in the YMCA, and of course the YMCA was a lot different back in those days. It was a lot more the Christian than it was even even today. And so he begins to work in that realm, and he invites a young guy by the name of Billy Sunday to come and work with him. Well, some of you are shaking your heads. Billy Sunday turned out to be one of the world's great evangelists as well. He was raised through Chapman, who was raised through Mayer, who was raised through Dwight L. Moody, who was touched by Kimball. All right, keep that in mind for a second. So, story goes, Billy Sunday came to Charlotte, North Carolina one day. He had a revival. Some folks, some business people in Charlotte said, you know what? Billy Sunday has done here in this place, we ought to do it again. And so they invited an evangelist by the name of Mordecai Ham to come to Charlotte to hold a revival, an extended revival. There in the back of that church or that back of that uh, auditorium at that point, a tent, was a young dairy farmer's son by the name of Billy. Billy. I could imitate Billy. <laughs> Billy Graham, all right. He came forward and accepted Jesus Christ. But wait a minute, don't stop there. Don't stop there. Billy Graham is preaching a crusade in 1980. It's televised as many of those crusades were alive back in those days. A little boy, 17 years old, with lots of hair, is going through, is going through the living room of the home. He's, and he stops. And something, something catches. The something was this. Billy Graham was beginning the invitation, and he said the words that he said over and over after every crusade. You may have your name on a church roll. You may have been going to church all your life. You may have been confirmed and baptized, but that doesn't mean you have a relationship with Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You may have religion, but not a relationship. So those who would get down, bow before him, Ask Jesus into your life as Lord and Savior. And those words caught. Those words caught a kid named David who had been confirmed, who had been baptized in the church, who had a name on a church roll, but who really truly didn't know Jesus Christ until that night. So let me tell you, guys, the seeds that were planted in 1850s and even further back, right? Kimball had to come through Christ to somebody. But that pebble that was thrown in the, in the water and the waves just continued to go out. Well, let me tell you, he's continued to make those waves influence others and others and others all the way up to this point today through so many. In fact, it was pretty cool. Left first service and somebody came to me and they said, David, out of first service, and they said, member of this church, said, I came to Christ the same way back in the 1970s. Jesus Christ, I mean, uh, Billy was preaching a crusade. And came through the living room and saw that. So again, you know, you don't know where you are in the link. You don't know where you are in the link of bringing someone to Christ, of influencing someone to Christ. But wouldn't you love it to be said you are a link? You are an influence? 
you are on that list of those who have touched another's life and they've looked at you and they have said, if Jesus is anything like you, Chris, or Virgil, Brian, Chrissy, if Jesus is anything like you, Linda, Phyllis, Preston, if Effie, if Jesus is anything like you, Luann, Dana, if there, Jesus is anything like them, I want to go to heaven. I want to go to heaven. Here's the challenge, folks. Go out today with the mindset that you're going to live more like Jesus. And then watch the ripples and watch the influence. And you lead others to Christ. You be that influential. You can do it. You can do it. Let's bow our heads. Where would God use you today? Because here's the deal, guys. It's as soon as you walk out these doors, there are people watching to see if it really made any difference. (laughs) Did it really make any difference? Or are you stooping right back down into the gutter of this world and just living like they are, blending in with everything else and everybody going around? Oh, my words. First church, maybe God's blessing us the way he is is because we're real in this place. And we have really met Jesus Christ. So maybe this is your day. Here's the challenge, church. Before you walk out these doors, make sure you have that relationship. Make sure you have been influenced in such a way that you get to heaven. How many of you, just bow your heads again. How many of you sitting here thinking to yourselves, I hope I get to heaven. I hope I make it. Well, listen, you don't have to hope. There is a blessed assurance. You can know for certain you're going to heaven. Jesus doesn't accept you because you're perfect, my friends. Nobody goes to heaven perfect, all right? We're made perfect when we get there, but nobody goes to heaven. Nobody dies here perfect. And as I heard a preacher at a funeral this week say, he said, you know, uh, this person, their goodness did not get them to heaven, and their bad things didn't keep them out. It was the grace of God that got them in. How many of you need the grace of God this morning in a real way? Young people, older people, you have held back because you didn't want to be embarrassed. But I ask you today, would you be like Jonathan? And you would, would you be willing to go even if nobody else does go? I'm going to stand down here. And if today is a day when Jesus has come into your life and you recognize your need of a Savior, all you got to do is admit that you are a sinner. Believe that Jesus Christ died on a cross for you and loves you that much. And then confess your sins to him. Commit your life to him. Ask him into your life. Just simply say, Jesus, I call on you today. And you'll have that relationship. And you'll start to be that influence. Okay, guys, head still bowed. I'm going to be standing down here. And don't be ashamed. If God has spoken into your life this day, if he's moving in such a way, you want to get it right and you want to make sure, I want to pray with you. I will not embarrass you any further. I just want to pray with you, okay? So please, as we sing this final song, you come down. Don't be ashamed. You come down. And let's pray about this. Lord, thank you for what you're doing in this place. The fields of harvest are ripe. And as we've seen others come to Christ through the years, Lord, we pray that the influence that was started long ago just keeps on happening. And that we can be a part of that chain that influences others towards you. Lord, continue to help us to see that the fields are white with harvest and you're looking, for, you're looking for harvesters. May we be that as we leave this place today. Lord, we love you, we praise you, we honor you. It's in Jesus' name only that we do all of these things. And all of God's people said, amen. Would you stand now as we praise?